Hi, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Scams and Consumer Rights. My name's Penny Sullivan. I'm a Capacity Building Lead at Community Legal Centres Queensland. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're holding today's webinar. In Mianjin, Brisbane, they are the Turrbal and the Yagara people. We pay deep respect to Elders past, present and emerging. As this webinar is being viewed by people across Queensland and around Australia, we also pay respects to the traditional owners throughout the country. We recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land in Australia and their continuing connection to land, water and culture. We acknowledge the stories, traditions and living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and commit to fostering a culture of learning from and working with First Nations peoples in the spirit of reconciliation and access to justice. We extend a very warm welcome to any First Nations peoples joining us today. So I'm very pleased to now welcome Josh Menon and Hadia Yaluka uh, from Morris Blackburn to present today's webinar. Josh and Hadia are going to discuss the responsibilities of banks and other financial institutions to protect customers from being scammed or compensate them where a loss is suffered, including instances where the loss is caused by financial abuse, and also to explore the way in which AFCA and the regulators handle these matters. Before I do that though, just some quick housekeeping. Today's webinar is being recorded and later today or tomorrow, I'll send a link for that recording along with a copy of the PowerPoint slides. We do encourage you to ask questions. Just type your question into the question box on the control panel and we'll read your question out. We will hold them until the end of the presentation, but do feel free to type them in as you think of them. I'll now hand over to Josh and Hadia and I'll talk to you again at the end of the session. Thanks so much, Josh. Thanks very much, Penny. It's great to be back and uh, terrific to see so much interest in this um, topic, uh, which I think is, is very important. Uh, and increasing uh, in its impact and importance. Um, so we've got loads to get through, so let's um, launch in. First, uh, just a bit of a, a high level, just on, on the scope of this problem. Um, these statistics are a couple of years old um, and the situation's only gotten worse, as we'll see from um, later slides on um, AFCA, the, uh, the relevant ombudsman's uh, annual report, but um, uh, as at September 2022, there was a uh, review done by the Consumer Action Law Centre based out of Melbourne, CALC, um, who no doubt many of you will know of. Um, and they sh that showed that annual scam related losses in Australia amounted to approximately $2 billion, marking an 84% increase on the previous year. And, and the implications of these uh, scam losses are obviously very um, devastating uh, and range from uh, you know, um, the, the, the hundreds to the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, uh, Calc's Calc analysis um, also looked at the uh, determinations by AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, as I said, is the relevant ombudsman, at least for um, bank uh, super fund and insurance related scam complaints by consumers. Um, and that showed that out of 62 determinations that they reviewed, uh, sorry, of the determinations they reviewed, 62 of those were in favour of the banks, whereas only five were in favour of the consumers. Um, and the complaints amounted to uh, over $10.5 million in losses. Um, consumer refunds in these cases were notably very low, totaling only $706,000, which represented less than 77% um, compared to the losses complained about. Um, the process uh, for securing refunds for scam losses through Africa complaints is, is fraught with challenges. Uh, I've had personal experience as has Haiti and, and no doubt there will be um, some on the line who have also um, advocated for consumers through the Africa process. It is um, difficult uh, and as those statistics um, bear out um, it's, it's, it's um, quite uh, disproportionate in, uh, in the way in which it, it resolves these matters. Um, so uh, part of the challenge is that um, AFCA, in my experience, feels like a bit of a home game for the financial services provider. And so for that reason, it's diff more difficult to settle matters for decent um, offers. 
they tend to get low ball offers of compensation um, and for that reason um, more of them go to determination and because uh, it's a forum where um, consumers are typically encouraged not to be re legally represented uh, it's supposed to be user friendly um, the consumers may not know what sorts of points to make or evidence to um, adduce to support their their claim so um, the uh, I think those are contributing factors to the uh, skewed outcomes against consumers too um, we are going to talk about some successful case studies though um, and some some uh, and give some guidance on the sorts of points that um, uh, consumers and their advocates should be looking to highlight in order to give themselves the best chance of success. So um, what are the banking industry's obligations um, in relation to scams? So banks' responsibilities and legal obligations in preventing scams and protecting uh, consumers include existing duties which require banks to identify red flags. We're going to talk a lot about red flags and potential scam activities. However, uh, inconsistent and inadequate responses to scam related losses raise concerns leading to consumer distrust and financial distress. And that's one of the reasons why the government um, has announced substantial reforms in this area, which we'll come to at the uh, towards the end of the presentation. What are the specific duties on banks? So first we'll deal with banks and then we'll move on to superannuation funds because those are the two areas that Hadier and I um, uh, have had most exposure to. But obviously there are scam activities across a range of different industries, including telcos and social media. Uh, we're not going to specifically deal with, with those um, today, except in the context of discussing the reforms, which um, May, which may or do already cover some of those industries uh, and may expand into others. <coughs> so, um, starting with banks, banks are obliged to exercise due care and skill under implied warranties in the consumer, uh, in the customer firm contract. That includes making reasonable inquiries about the purpose of the transaction and not proceed with the transfer until they are reasonably satisfied that the transaction is not fraudulent. Austrac regulated banks must monitor customer transactions to detect criminal activities. And since the uh, Banking Royal Commission, um, we've seen an emphasis on the Corporations Act obligation sec uh, in section 912 capital A, uh, which requires that services are conducted efficiently, honestly, and fairly. Uh, and that's, that's a, a powerful and broad um, principle uh, statutory uh, duty that that you can rely upon and that um, it's also clear from the Banking Royal Commission that um, banks are urged to invest in fraud detection capabilities rather than burdening customers themselves um, with all of the onus. There's the code of practice, code of banking practice um, which is uh, developed and, and sort of owned by the Australian Banking Association, the ABA, um, and that's said to prioritise fair, ethical and reasonable conduct, particularly in protecting vulnerable customers from financial abuse, including scams. And there are substantial guidelines on vulnerable customers, what constitutes a vulnerable customer, um, obviously d disability um, uh, and um, non-English speaking background and, um, and elderly people may come within that category. Um, and that's where, um, uh, you know, economic coercion, elder abuse, and those sorts of uh, societal problems intersect with scam activities. Um, banks might be liable if they are aware of undue influence preventing a customer's free and genuine choice during a transaction observed through call recordings between banks and customers. So those call recordings that, that banks and other financial institutions um, like to take, um, they can actually protect the, the customer and be relied upon by the customer just as much as the as the bank in evidence. Um, I will hand over to Hadia, um, who will now discuss a particular matter in which she advocated, which I think is uh, is highly uh, is of great interest in in relation to bank scam activity. <laughs> 
Thanks, Josh. Um, and following on from the discussion about um, the specific duties on banks, I'll come back to how we utilised some of those um, arguments in our case. But this was a really um, quite a devastating story for our client, Michael. I should add that I've de-identified Michael for, to protect his privacy, um, but the outcome we achieved was not subject to any confidentiality clause. So I am able to reveal that this was a, a case against Eubank. So Michael had um, about a, a year before coming to us received a call on his mobile um, from a no-call ID number. Um, he answered hello, he didn't state his name, and he was um, speaking to a male with a British accent who said, am I speaking to Michael and his surname? And he responded, yes. Um, he said, I'm from Eubank and there's been some suspicious activity on your Eubank debit card account, which is linked to eBay. And somebody from India has forged your ID on eBay and spent $420 on a purchase. He said, Eubank is gonna cancel the card and send you another one. And then he said, I need your four, last four digits on your Ubank debit card, as well as your ATM pin number, which I might add are different numbers. Um, and our client instructed us that he did not give the person on the phone the pin number for his Ubank app, which is a different number. And so um, he was then asked to confirm, is this your correct email address and residential address, which this man accurately recited over the phone. And he seemingly appeared to be a, a you know a person who was authorised to speak um, to him from Eubank, and he believed that giving his ATM pin number and the last four digits of his card would only be useful to somebody who was actually from the bank. He certainly knew that if he gave his pin number to his online banking account, um, that that would allow somebody potentially to log in and make unauthorised transactions. And so he wasn't alert while he was on the phone to the fact that this could be a scam caller. It wasn't until he hung up and then he checked his Ubank app um, to have a look at his accounts and noticed that an extra savings account had been set up in his name um, and, and together with somebody else. So a shared account, a shared Ubank account had been set up between our client Michael and somebody by the name of Calvin who he did not recognise. He then realised that money was being taken out of his four accounts, left, right and centre, and transferred into this bogus shared account. Um, and um, in the first instance, it was about $8,000. And so he then realized, oh my goodness, that call that I just got was clearly a scam call. Um, somebody must have got my details, perhaps through the, um, he was a victim of the Optus um, breach. Uh, and he believes that perhaps somebody got his number. Um, he doesn't know how um, they got all the other details about him, but, um, but he believes that he understood in that moment that he was a victim of a scam. Um, he, I should add, had a mild intellectual or has a mild intellectual disability. Um, and so he immediately called his mother who assists him on all of his day-to-day -day, um, uh, life admin tasks. Um, and they then immediately called the bank. Um, they, when they called the bank, um, they received an automated message at the beginning of the call recording to say, if you believe you've been directly impacted by the recent scam activity, please press two. So obviously Ubank were alert to recent scam activity such that they set up a specific channel to deal with these inquiries. And our client and his mother believed and reasonably expected that the staff handling the call would uh, be adequately equipped to take swift action and mitigate the losses um, that might happen because of this scam. So they get on the phone and about three minutes into um, the call, they finally get off hold and the mother tells the Eubank staff member that she thinks that her son's been scammed. And at that stage, $8,000 had been taken from his account and says, tell me what information you need and I'll give it to you. Um, she also asked numerous times, has the account been frozen? Um, oh my goodness, she said, just a second ago, they've taken out another $800. It was there a minute ago. Can you freeze it? Can you see that? Um, to which the Eubank staff member responded, oh, I'm, I'm just on my way to freeze it. Um, puts them on hold, needs to speak to a supervisor, comes back, um, queries how this shared account was open. And it seemed pretty clear that the staff member on the phone just wasn't sure how to handle the situation. Um, assumed that the shared account, which we say was a bogus shared account, was legitimate. And a few times throughout the call mentions that he needs to speak to his, his supervisor. By the time the call ends, a total of $29,988 had been stolen and transferred into bogus shared accounts and then later transferred out of those 
um, UBank accounts and, and we don't know what happened to that money. Um, so this was pretty devastating. Um, this was a, a young man who had, um, as I said, a mild intellectual disability. Um, when he set up his UBank account initially, his mother had said, look, um, when we've set up accounts with different banks, we've always, they've because of this intellectual disability that he has, um, I'm always the contact person and I'm always the person that authorises any decisions that need to be made. If contact needs to be made, um, please don't contact Michael directly. Um, they said, well, in order to implement that kind of a system, we need to see a power of attorney. We can't have you as an authorised person on the account unless we've got a power of attorney. Um, his disability is not to the extent that he needed to appoint such a person. And so they then had to um, have Michael manage his accounts day to day. And But there were no alerts put on the system to notify um, the bank that, hey, you know, this is a person with an increased vulnerability and he may need extra protection um, or perhaps some more support if any contact needs to be made to him. So um, it was it was pretty clear from the beginning that they were on notice that this was a person with a disability and who needed some extra support. Um, now, after they realised that um, about 29 or almost $30,000 has been stolen, um, they uh, contact the bank and say, look, this is, we've clearly been a victim of some, of some scam activity and we want the bank to do everything it can to recover the money. And we would like to, for Michael to be put back in the position that he was in, um, you know, were it not for the, the failings of the bank's system um, in, in, to protect him from this fraudulent activity. Um, the bank um, did not deal with this in, in a way that we would think is consistent with their obligations. Um, and in making this complaint directly to the bank, they initially received an offer of $1,000 of compensation which they rejected. Um, and uh, Michael and his parents then decide to um, lodge a complaint with AFCA. Um, and through that AFCA process, the bank essentially maintains its position that they do not take any accountability, that Michael essentially gave the keys to the caller when he gave his PIN number over the phone. And um, I believe at some point through the process, a further offer of, of was made of $2,000 compensation, which was rejected. So about 10 months into the process, um, you know, all the while, Michael was extremely um, agitated and, and distraught by this. This was his life savings. He was saving up to go on a trip. He was saving up for a guitar. Um, and he was, you know, it was interfering with his ability to work as well because he was just so upset. Um, that, and he was being blamed throughout this process that he was the person that actually caused, um, you know, the, the, the scam to happen, that he essentially gave the keys to the caller. So Michael and his parents decided to come to Morris Blackburn and they instructed us to take over the AFCA complaint and advocate for him at the upcoming conciliation, which was booked in for two months after we were engaged. So in that two month period, um, we decided to prepare for conciliation. And there were a number of things that we did um, uh, before that, including demanding um, various things. So before the conciliation, we, um, we wrote a detailed letter to AFCA demanding the call recording of the initial call when the bank account was set up and the bank was notified of his intellectual disability. One factor that we highlighted, which the client and his, his family did not, was this, um, this factor that he was vulnerable. Um, initially, they were worried that uh, highlighting this vulnerability would mean that they would, you know, think that he would make a pretty bad witness and, you know, that they might call um, their bluff and say, okay, we'll take us to the magistrate's court um, and, and he'll have to give evidence and he'll be a terrible witness. Um, my view was that actually, no, that's not at all what would happen. I, I think that there's a heightened responsibility on the bank where they are on notice of a person who is um, vulnerable and who has an intellectual disability. And we really needed to highlight that as much as possible. So putting them on notice that we wanted the initial call recording of when the bank account was set up um, so that we could have them on the hook for, for the notice of the vulnerability was really important and something that I think hadn't come into the complaint at that point. We wanted all the call recordings of when um, the contact was made with the, the bank uh, following the scam. Um, they only provided one recording, which was half of that call um, and, and up to the point that the person put the client and his mother on hold and went to speak to his supervisor. We didn't ever get the second part of that recording. We also wanted to know where did the money go from the bogus shed account to other Ubank accounts? Ubank would be in a position to be able to trace that, um, certainly before it was transferred out to any external accounts. Um, and we wanted more information about what steps the staff member took 
uh, once it was on notice, once he was on notice that these were clearly not legitimate accounts, um, the bogus shared account was not legitimate uh, and what attempts were made to trace the money and recover it. Um, we also started to signal that this was not just limited to our client, that this actually probably was a broader issue um, and that this bank may be vulnerable generally because it's poor systems and processes. And we started to say, well, what is, we want to know a bit more about Eubank's procedures relating to consumers with vulnerability. Um, <clears throat> we also wanted to understand a bit more about how does this bank actually take steps to prevent scam activity and protect vulnerable consumers like Michael? So what steps were they taking to um, implement friction in the processing of funds? Um, a big recommendation when you look at the ASIC report um, that, that Josh has cited and um, that is very useful in articulating um, a lot of recommendations to banks, ASIC report 761 dated April 2023, talks about the implementation of friction, so slowing down transactions so that the bank firstly has an, pardon me, has an opportunity to investigate and proactively contact customers to ask for authorization of whether or not this is a legitimate transaction or not, um, but equally to allow customers to um, be alert to and you know be able to check online um, to see if anything, um, any transactions are happening that may not be something that they have actually um, authorised. Um, we wanted to also understand, well, how are customers experiencing vulnerability managed um, and how are staff actually trained in that kind of vulnerability management um, and what systems and processes and alerts are in place to support staff so that customers are protected. Um, and also whether any changes have been made by the bank to the steps that it requires um, to register a new device on a bank account since the scam activity. Um, in this case, the person had somehow registered a device so that um, he could authorise the transaction uh, and the, and the movement of money into this shared account. Um, and it was very difficult to follow the paper trail as to how that actually um, played out. Obviously, scammers are extremely intelligent and sophisticated people, um, albeit they're using um, those skills for, um, for bad and not good. Um, but it was very, very difficult to follow the information that we were given as to how the bank's systems um, were so vulnerable to this um, person being able to do this remotely. Um, and so we did uh, also do a bit of research. We found a recent news article of a um, of a similar story uh, of a person being scammed who was also a Ubank customer. That person didn't have a vulnerability. Um, and so one thing that I continue to share with my client was that, you know, don't feel like you've, um, you know, you caused this or you brought this upon yourself. There are people who don't have vulnerabilities that equally are victims to these um, awful crimes. So we, we started to flag that if this was not resolved at conciliation, we wanted to potentially look at a systemic issue complaint as well. Um, and the AFCA rules do allow you to broaden the complaint um, uh, in some cases to make it a systemic issue. Um, and I think it's A17.1 uh, of AFCA's Complaint Resolution Scheme rules dated the 7th of March, 2024. So um, we went to the conciliation and um, alarmingly the bank, you know, continued to maintain its position and started off the conciliation again saying, well, you know, your client essentially gave the keys to the scammer, which, you know, essentially just rubbed salt into the wound. Um, and we reiterated the bank ultimately has the duty to identify red flags and should really query a customer's mandate when they identify a possible scam. And the obligation is on the bank to take care um, in protecting their customers. So this comes back to the duties that Josh touched on earlier. Um, including 12 ED of the ASIC Act, implied there are implied warranties in a customer firm contract to impose a duty to exercise due care and skill. Banks are obviously regulated by Austrac, so they should be monitoring transactions for criminal activity rather than leaving it to consumers to, um, you know, to have to report the, the crime um, or to be alert to the fact that they might be a victim of crime. Um, and we say that, you know, obligation, the obligation was on Eubank to conduct services efficiently, honestly and fairly, and that that has been given so much more emphasis since the Banking Royal Commission, and that that obligation is now codified in 912A1A of the Corporations Act. And so a more efficient and fair approach would be for Eubank to have invested in capabilities to identify fraud risk compared to placing the onus on the consumer 
And we highlighted to Eubank that ASIC actually monitors and enforces that obligation. Um, we, we talked about the, the code of banking practice and that includes a promise to engage in fair, reasonable and ethical practice. Um, and also the Australian Banking Association industry guideline about protecting consumers from financial abuse. Um, and again, talked about the fact that banks may face liability uh, where the bank has knowledge of undue influence applied to a customer, which might prevent the customer from making a genuine and free choice regarding the transaction. Um, the biggest thing that we wanted to highlight here was that the, the bank failed to proactively step in um, and when notified, the bank really failed to reactively um, deal with the matter in a prompt and efficient way. So banks often provide and should provide specific warnings of risky or potential scam transactions by contacting consumers ahead of the transaction proceeding, <clears throat> pardon me, but then only proceeding in the event that the customer consents to the transaction. They should ask, do you accept the risk of this transfer? Um, the other thing that was a real problem here for the bank was that the transfer of the funds in that one day had greatly exceeded its daily limit of $20,000 a day. And we just couldn't understand how that did not signal any kind of alert to the bank's um, system. Um, the other thing was that for someone that was experiencing a, a vulnerability like our client was, why was the daily limit on his account $20,000 a day? In fact, you know, we looked at other banks um, and they certainly have a much lower limit. Uh, and that's not just for consumers that have a vulnerability. So at the very least, um, without sort of, you know, celebrating the big four banks, we did say that at least as a, on a comparable view, um, its practices were certainly subpar um, and really were obviously uh, made it vulnerable to, to um, huge losses compared to, you know, where you could have mitigated the loss at least to a smaller amount. Um, and so a key thing here was the lack of friction, the, the speed with which this scammer was able to move money um, into the shared account and then out of the shared account into somewhere else was quite alarming. Um, it happened in real time. It was visible to our client on his app. Um, and had, that, had there been a slowdown of that process, then um, certainly the, the bank um, would have been able to recover the money or stop more money from being stolen. Um, and so, Additional to that, we're just observing and listening to the call recording. Uh, the person online just was not equipped to deal with the, um, the situation uh, hastily. Um, and, and he certainly wasn't equipped to, you know, to, to deal with it, assuming that it was a scam. There was still a lot of questioning, assuming that the setting up of this shared account was legitimate. And so um, we demanded a number of things at the conciliation. Um, the first thing was the direct financial loss of $28,998. We wanted interest. Um, we wanted uh, indirect financial losses, which you can claim of up to $6,300 for um, legal fees, and non-financial loss of up to $6,300 for inconvenience. And we said Eubank's poor management of the claim and the time taken for Eubank to resolve the situation lowball our client those offers and then the interference it caused with his enjoyment of peace of mind and his ability to work um, these were significant factors that should be compensated as well um, the bank took a while to consider its position but it finally agreed to pay the full $28,988 back um, and it also agreed to pay a thousand dollars of non-financial loss to Michael as well um, the conciliator was uh, you know uh, I, I dare say a little bit pushy in, in trying to reach an agreement on the day and, and told us that, you know, if we wanted to push on for an ombudsman uh, determination, it would be quite some time. And there was no guarantee that this was the outcome that would be offered, um, nor that um, any other compensation would be paid if we went through that process. Um, our client and his family were very, very happy to accept the offer of the full amount back, plus the non-financial loss. And I think just um, on a more human level, it was um, really heartbreaking to hear the mother explain to me as we prepared for conciliation that her son had been walking around for a year in their house saying, you know, I'm dumb, I'm dumb. The reason this happened to me is because I'm dumb. Um, and he truly did blame himself. And, he, and the bank certainly reinforced that belief in him that he uh, contributed to or, or caused the losses that he suffered. Um, and at least this outcome enabled him to feel like actually he was vulnerable and needed to be protected. And the bank certainly made um, itself very vulnerable to scammers, which is why he suffered this awful crime. 
Um, it was also really lovely to hear that whilst he had been disengaged in playing the guitar um, for all that time, he then um, was going to use this money to buy a new guitar and finally book that trip that he'd been saving up for. So it was a remarkable turnaround from where the client and his family started with the $2,000 offer of compensation um, and then to finally get all the money back. So um, I think that really highlights um, some of the key takeaways um, when you're preparing for these sorts of conversations or conciliations that you might be engaged to um, act in, is, is looking for evidence of red flags that you can highlight to a bank to make them feel at risk to um, contribute something or pay back all of the money to the customer. Um, one was the transaction size, larger than normal transactions. In this case, um, Michael had never set up a joint account before. And he certainly never transferred that amount of money in one hit nor in one day. And so that was a really unusual transaction and something that should have alerted the bank to the fact that this was not a legitimate transaction. Um, another thing is just any kind of change in transaction patterns should alert the bank. Um, if there are transfers to jurisdictions for, for known scam activities, that's something that the bank should be responsible for. Um, looking for vulnerability of the customer, such as age or disability. In this case, that wasn't a factor that the customer or our client had highlighted before we were engaged, but it was something that we were able to make more clear to the bank once we were advocating. Um, and request to increase transfer limits made by the customer. These are all things that the bank should be alert to. Lack of clarity regarding the purpose of the transfers and receiving instructions from a third party other than the customer. So I'd say that these are all things um, to look out for and, and good points to raise if you're advocating for a client who's a victim of a scam. Thanks very much, Heidi. Um, congratulations again on that outcome. Um, it's uh, it's really helpful, I think, to for you to have laid out those um, legal arguments that you made, which can be applied um, in so many other um, scenarios. Uh, so that's a really helpful toolkit. Um, moving on now to superannuation fund scams. Um, these aren't anywhere near as prevalent, but um, as we'll hear um, later from AFCA's annual report, um, they are um, becoming more common. Uh, superannuation is a big, big pot of money. And so it's really inevitable that, um, that scams, scammers and, and um, rogues involved in this scamming industry would turn their attention to it. Um, uh, this was a, uh, a story of Lee uh, Braz, who, which was highlighted earlier this year um, by the ABC journalist Michael Atkin. Um, I um, have attached some links there, which um, will be in the slides that come out to you, so you can uh, can watch the uh, the program, um, which sets out the bare facts, but. In summary, what occurred here is um, <clears throat> uh, Lee uh, was contacted by a scammer purporting to be an, an accountant uh, or from an accounting firm, and um, the uh, suggestion was made that he ought to uh, set up a self-managed super fund uh, by transferring his his uh, uh, super um, uh, accumulated super account balance uh, into an SMSF. Um, his account balance was with Host Plus, uh, and um, he uh, handed over some basic details. Um, his, his obviously his name, uh, his address, and some other information um, to the scammer. Um, he didn't make the application himself. The application um, was made by the scammer, who and the scammer uh, again, they're very sophisticated. They they actually do set up a self-managed super fund uh, and uh, and then make the application for the, the transfer of funds from the super account, the host plus super account in this case to the SMSF. Uh, in total was um, the entire account balance of around $180,000. So what happened then was um, Lee took his matter to AFCA. He argued that there were a number of red flags, which uh, Host Plus as the trustee with its fiduciary obligations to him um, should have picked up on and it should not have proceeded to allow uh, the rollover to occur. And the red flags were numerous, but one of them, for example, was that there was a discrepancy in the state in which the um, person who certified his identification 
um, was was in um, compared to the state that Lee lived in. Um, and so AFCA made a determination that um, the Superfund trustee uh, was not liable uh, and that the red flags weren't sufficient such that it should have um, blocked the transaction um, or even alerted it to contact Lee to verify or validate the, the transaction. Um, so Lee then went and um, appealed um, that decision to the federal court. And so under the um, AFCA legislation in the, in the Corporations Act, um, there is a statutory right to appeal uh, decisions of superannuation related to superannuation funds um, on questions of law. And so um, the matter proceeded to uh, the federal court. And so that what happened then was the federal court um, found in favour of Lee, uh, found that there were errors of law by, made by AFCA in um, providing its determination on this issue, and it remitted the matter back to AFCA. Um, no costs order was made in Lee's favour, unfortunately. So Lee was, was out of pocket, um, having to pay his lawyers to have argued that um, in the federal court, uh, and then it went back to Africa, as I say, for for a redetermination to for Africa to fix its its earlier determination in accordance with the decision in the federal court. Unfortunately, Africa's redetermination um, only uh, provided compensation of thirty percent to Lee uh, of the total losses, which overall meant that he's worse off as a result of having won in the federal court um, to establish that AFCA's decision was wrong. Um, so let's get into some of the meat of that, that federal court decision. Um, and there's the citation, Braz versus Host Plus, it's a 2023 decision. Uh, and so here are some comments um, by, uh, in, which are found in the judgment. So it rested on the two main criticisms of AFCA's decision rested on the CIS regulations, that's the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act uh, and its associated regulations. So regulation 6.33 provides that a member of a regulated superannuation fund may request in writing that the whole or part of the member's withdrawal ben benefit in the transferring fund be rolled over to a receiving fund. So, so that's what's occurred here. There's been a request made in writing for the withdrawal of the host plus into a receiving fund, namely the SMSF that was created by the scammer. Um, the problem though, was that it has to be done by a member of the regulated superannuation fund. That request was submitted in writing by the scammer, not by the member, okay? That was an important point noted by um, the judge. Regulation 6.28, which deals with rollover of regulated super funds to approved deposit fund provides, except where it is otherwise provided by the Act, the Corporations Act, the Corporations Regulations, or these regulations, a, member, a member's benefit in a regulated superannuation fund must not be rolled over from the fund unless the member has given to the trustee the member's consent to the rollover. So, a third party cannot provide a member's consent. It has to be given by the member themselves. And so the court found that this issue should have been considered by AFCA and that the failure to do so is an error of law, hence the remitter back to AFCA to fix its determination. It didn't make any final determinations on the um, arguments raised in relation to the specific red flags, um, one of which I mentioned before about the jurisdiction jurisdictional irregularity of the uh, Justice of the Peace, I think it was, who certified the ID. It didn't need to because uh, it found um, in, in his favour on those points that I've just ran through. So what is consent? Um, because um, all of these, just to go back a slide, these um, regulations talk about the member's consent. What is consent? Well, um, in its redetermination, um, AFCA found that consent was provided and it was reasonable for the super fund to believe that consent had been given by, um, by Lee because consent means, in the regulations, consent means written consent 
or any other form of consent determined by the regulator as sufficient in the circumstances. So then you have to look at, well, what um, has the regulator said about what consent is? Now I'll come back to that because in my opinion, AFCA completely overlooked what the regulator has explicitly said uh, about um, can, what consent uh, amounts to. Instead, what AFCA did wrongly, in my opinion, in its redetermination is found that the super fund had apparent consent, even though it didn't have actual consent. So what is apparent consent? Apparent consent is a, is a, a common law concept um, that you, you can find mainly um, from my research in um, North American uh, jurisprudence in relation to tort law. Um, so it's a situation where somebody doesn't actually subjectively believe that they're giving consent, but it is reasonable based on their conduct or other factors, it is reasonable for the transactor, transacting party or the counterparty to believe that consent is being provided. And so the argument ran according to AFCA that it was reasonable for um, host plus trustee to believe that consent was being provided even though it wasn't. So then returning to what the regulator and the relevant regulator in this instance, because it's a super fund is APRA, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, has actually published um, a determination. Uh, it's back from 2002, so it's long in the tooth, but it is nevertheless um, the uh, extant determination in relation to this issue. And last time I checked, as of a couple of months ago, if you go into APRA's website, it says so. And what that says is that there's a form, it sets out the form of non-written consent sufficient for rolling over or transferring benefits and sets out very strict criteria for when non-written consent can be accepted by, for, by a super fund for a transfer. It states a transaction can only be validly made after the member has properly conveyed his or her written consent using the identifier. So again, it has to be conveyed by the member and it has to be done using an identifier as opposed to a written consent, like a form. And then the explanatory memorandum says, the usage of non-written consent is optional. It is for the funds trustee to decide whether the circumstances of the fund are such that providing for non-written consent for rollovers or transfers is viable or desirable. If a trustee chooses to accept non-written consent, to such transactions, the determination must be complied with. And so there's no evidence um, at all that this particular trustee um, had made a decision to accept identifiers as a form of non-written consent. Um, by the way, identifier is, is defined there um, on the right of the slide. It means a unique identifier allocated to a member by a trustee. Um, and it might be, for example, a group of numbers or a password. It's got nothing to do with this concept of apparent consent um, from, um, from co the common law. Um, but unsurprisingly, um, uh, well, perhaps not unsurprisingly, um, unfortunately for Mr. Braz, or Lee, sorry, I'm calling him Lee, um, uh, uh, AFCA did not um, cite this particular document, which I've provided a link to, um, and instead applied this notion of apparent consent defined against him, um, except in to the tune of 30%. And, and that was done on the basis that um, he was um, he, he was partly, um, or, uh, or, or it would seem 60%, uh, sorry, 70% um, responsible um, for, because he handed over the keys. Um, uh, to use the, the t expression Hadia used before. So that was Lee Brazza's story. Um, speaking more generally, what are the super funds obligations? Um, so we can look at um, the APRA SPG 280 payment standards, uh, and these set out um, illegal early release and identity crimes. So. APRA identifies illegal early release schemes and identity crimes as significant threats. Um, 
and licensees are expected to identify and mitigate their risks, breach of payment standards or risks, risk management obligations due to IER or identity crimes may render an RSC licensee liable to affected members for any losses incurred. While risks are typically higher in self-managed super funds, they are, also, they are relevant across all registered superannuation fund entities. And continuing on, um, licensees are advised to include specific provisions within their risk management frameworks to establish robust systems and procedures aimed at significantly reducing the risk and opportunity for these types of crimes. So um, again, um, as you can see from, from Hadia's experience uh, as an advocate, it's good to go and put in a request for information um, and, in, and for super funds that would include a request for details of their risk management frameworks dealing with um, these types of protections that should be in place at a system level. These systems and procedures aim to identify that benefits are directed to the appropriate recipient, utilising the ATO's electronic services, uh, upon, upon completion of risk assessments, APRA generally expects licensees to process rollovers or transfers in line with the member's valid request and the portability rules outlined in the superannuation data and payment regulations. These rules dictate that licensees should aim to complete the rollover or transfer within three business days of receiving all mandatory information from the member. So that's the current framework uh, for superannuation fund uh, responsibilities. Um, because of time constraints, I'm going to push past this next um, case study. I, it is remarkably similar to Lee Braz's story. It has even the same sorts of red flags in relation to the superannuation rollover um, and, and interstate irregularities. Um, uh, but I wanted to, so I wanted to leave it up there. I've cited the AFCA case number. And so when these slides are distributed, you can look that up on AFCA's website and um, read that determination if you want to. Um, it is a finding against um, this consumer. I've de-identified him and called him Peter. Um, uh, so um, again, it shows that AFCA are, are consistent, at least in, in their approach, um, when they encounter these types of superannuation rollover scam complaints, but unfortunately they've been consistent in favour of the, the trustee um, uh, wrongly in, in my view. Um, but as I say, I won't go into the specific details of that. Um, I'll hand over now to Hadia because there's some hot off the press um, uh, reporting um, by AFCA uh, as to its scam activity, as to scam complaints in the last year. Over to you, Hadia. Thanks, Josh. Yes, so AFCA did an annual review over for the 2023 to 2024 period um, and looked at the top five scam complaint products received. And as you can see at the top of that list is the personal transaction accounts um, that seem to be the highest target for scam issues. Um, and the second is credit cards followed by online accounts, electronic banking, and then business transaction accounts. Um, and AFCA have said that phishing spoofing and, and remote access scams remain widespread. There have been a significant increase in bank impersonation scams, while investment and romance scams continue to cause major financial losses. Investment scams often involve transferring funds to cryptocurrency platforms, although efforts by financial firms to restrict these transfers have had some success. Um, and, and AFCA also looked at um, some introducing some mandatory industry codes um, and have said that the government should introduce these mandatory codes to enhance scam prevention and protection, potentially reducing the volume of scam related complaints reaching us. So we really need the government to get behind this um, to ensure that future consumers are protected given the, how sophisticated scammers are, are becoming and how much um, all these other platforms are going to be used um, to scam people. Um, and while, when we look at super scams though, um, while complaints about scams and fraud within super remain low, AFCA have said that they're very concerned that there are signs that cyber criminals are beginning to turn their attention to the superannuation industry. And we strongly urge trustees to strengthen their safeguards against this activity. And certainly you can see when you read um, or you listen to um, Lee Braz's case and the other case study also within the slides, um, you'll understand why that is just so important. <clears throat> 
Yeah, thanks, Heidi. And the uh, the the graphs really speak for themselves when you see that um, there's been an increase from around 6,000 complaints to well over 10,000 complaints in just one year. Uh, it's staggering. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think that's that's a good segue into this this last section um, because you've got um, AFCA calling for um, mandatory codes of practice uh, and um, government reform, um, and so that's uh, that's let's talk about what the government is doing. There have been uh, draft reforms announced, um, something called a scam prevention framework and the SPF. Um, so it's a big step uh, and it's a, and it's a positive step but as as is often the case with these types of reforms um, it's sort of step one um, in 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 a process which really needs to be a lot more comprehensive than is currently um, proposed but um, the government is saying well it's a it's a framework to start with and then it'll get down into the detail so um, how does the framework operate well here's um, just a graphic which shows it'll it'll establish the primary law <coughs> which will apply um, across the various industries that it will first be uh, um, it will first relate to or have jurisdiction over so for our purposes um, particularly we're talking about um, the banking scam uh, issues so that'll be in the banking designation um, bucket and then there, it will also initially apply to telcos and digital platform designations and so the banking scams will be regulated by a banking code um, which is still yet to be developed there's no concept, there's no draft code at this stage um, that will come after the framework has been established through um, through the, the, a, a bill which is um, currently uh, under consultation. And then there'll be uh, also a, a telco code and digital platform codes. So this is the model that the government has decided to adopt. Um, the exposure draft uh, explanatory materials um, say that the amendments introduce a framework for protecting Australians against scams with the following features. Overarching principles that apply to regulated entities, sector specific codes that apply to regulated sectors, and it's a multi-regulator framework. So different regulators will uh, will be involved at in relation to different uh, or their relevant uh, industries. Um, and I'll show a graphic in a moment which demonstrates that more clearly. And it will also set out dispute resolution mechanisms. And in the case of uh, financial services providers, um, uh, it's anticipated that that will, uh, that will primarily or exclusively be AFCA. And the uh, explanatory materials also say that a, the SPF principles relate to governance arrangements relating to scams, preventing scams, detecting scams, reporting scams, disrupting scams and responding to scams because obviously the government and, and probably everyone agrees that the best way to address scams is is to um, prevent them from happening in the first place and um, it's it's obviously up to consumers to be um, careful and prudent but it's also very much incumbent upon financial services providers uh, and, and other businesses um, to ensure that they have appropriate checks and balances and frameworks in place um, to mitigate the risks of scam activities on their platforms. Um, and that way we don't have to have an argument about who pays compensation and how much. Um, further document on the, in the, um, uh, on the Treasury consultation website is a summary of reforms. Um, and so whilst initially it will only be applicable to the three uh, industries that I've uh, set out a couple of slides back, it says the Treasury Minister may use the designation mechanism to designate further sectors and the relevant regulator into the framework over time where scam activity shifts. This could involve superannuation funds, digital currency exchanges and other payment providers and transaction based digital platforms like online marketplaces. 
So the framework, whilst it will initially only apply to the th those three industries, can be expanded as the because it gives a discretion to the minister to make expansive designations in different sectors. And so hopefully it won't be too long before that applies to super funds, insurers and so forth. Um, so what are the limitations at the moment? Well, as I mentioned, the codes themselves are yet to be developed. So we can't comment at this stage on whether they are on, on their substance. Um, um, also, uh, it's, I think it's important to note that the, the, scam, the definition of scam is quite um, narrow. It must involve deception uh, and if successful would result in a loss or harm to the consumer. Um, so it, it's, not just success, it's not just successful scams that um, can apply and, and give rise to breaches of these codes and, and, and therefore penalties. I'll come to the penalties in a minute. Um, it's also unsuccessful scams. The test is whether or not the scam, if it was successful, would have harmed the consumer, but it has to involve a deception. So it won't cover all unauthorised transactions. So for example, where it happened without the consumer's knowledge, it wouldn't cover that situation. Um, and, and what it says is um, the proposed definition of an SPF customer is not intended to capture unauthorised fraud, such as cyber crimes that may use hacking and data breaches that do not involve the deception of a consumer into uh, performing an action that results in loss or harm, including unauthorised payments. This is because scams are related to, but distinguished from other types of fraud. So it's not just a straight up fraud or an unauthorised transaction, like if somebody, for example, steals a credit card or, or credit card details and starts using it, um, those would fall outside the, this framework. This is in for situations where uh, like the, the scenarios we've highlighted where there is a deception involved. There's some sort of in exchange or interaction between the scammer and the consumer, which has resulted in the, the consumer handing over information in, um, is the most common form. So um, I mentioned before the multi-regulator model. Um, here's a graphic. Um, of what that looks like. Um, the overarching uh, regulator is the ACCC, a whole of ecosystem regulator responsible for the overarching framework. And the ACCC will take enforcement action in response to a breach of principles-based obligations, such as where there has been, um, where there has been no code breach. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that, uh, what that is referring to. Uh, sorry, this was, um, a, a document which uh, was was um, provided to me by Treasury in uh, in a briefing. Um, so sorry, I didn't I didn't um, write that one. Um, but uh, it says or in response to a referral from a sector regulator. Um, and so then you can see the sector regulator ASIC um, administers and enforces the sector specific for banks. Um, okay, so. Uh, ASIC is the relevant regulator for banking code breaches, and and I anticipate that APRA would be the relevant regulator for uh, superannuation fund breaches if and when the minister expands the legislation to apply to super funds. And then you've got ACMA for telcos and the ACCC again for um, digital platform service providers. Sector specific re regulators will be the first point of action for breaches of sector specific codes. So what are the penalties looking like? Um, the framework establishes a tiered penalty regime with higher penalties applying for serious contraventions with more significant consumer impacts. But you can see there that the penalty, um, maximum penalties are very substantial. Uh, and so for um, tier two, tier one contraventions, which are the most serious, um, that can be up to $50 million. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it, it is a big stick for the government to, to have, for the regulator to have. Um, that rounds us out. We're one minute over. Um, 
thank you very much for your attention today. I hope that's been of interest to you. We'll get these slides out to you. And uh, if you uh, ever want to get in contact with us uh, and uh, or would like to uh, discuss a matter or look to refer anything across to us, uh, there are our details. Uh, thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Hey, Josh, are you able to stay on for a minute for a couple of quick questions? Absolutely. Yeah, we've still got about 100 people on the call. so. Uh, people might start jumping off if they're not able to stay on, but we do have a couple of interesting questions that I thought might be worth uh, getting your response to. So this one comes from Siobhan. She said, I find a lot of banks refuse point blank to share their internal policies with anyone who isn't AFCA and are increasingly refusing to provide recordings as well, even to AFCA. When the bank's argument is that they were following their own internal procedure, is the complainant entitled to a copy? How are you seeing AFCA respond to refusals to provide recordings? Yeah, this is this is um, a time old issue, not just in the issue in the area of scams. Um, financial service providers don't like providing this material. They often cite um, uh, confidentiality or or competition based reasons for not wanting to hand over their policies and procedures. Um, we always. Um, push back and, and insist that it is relevant and therefore discoverable. Um, when you're in a litigation setting, obviously you've got a lot more um, power to press for these types of discovery. Um, when you're in the ombudsman, um, it's up to the, the ombudsman to determine uh, what it will compel. Uh, and I've, in my, my experience has been that, there's, that there's, it's quite inconsistent. Um, it depends upon um, which case manager um, you have, um, and so uh, I don't know that AFCA has any any clear guidelines. I, I might be wrong about that about what is discoverable in the context of scam matters, but it would be good if it did. Um, Heidi, you might want to just um, clarify whether or not you actually got that that material when you requested it before conciliation. Yeah, we didn't get all of the material we requested. Um, so we got some, but not all of the call recordings. Um, and in regards to policies and procedures, we got the blanket response that it was uh, commercially sensitive and that they didn't need to give it to us. Um, we wanted to then highlight, well, one of, the, one of the concerns my client had was, do we defer the conciliation while we press on and push for this information? My view was that their failure to provide it in itself was quite telling. Um, you know, if, if you've got a financial services provider that isn't willing to cough up information that can really objectively tell the, the story, like a call recording, well, that's quite telling in and of itself. Um, and, I, and I found, I, I thought that that might actually work in our favour. And so we decided not to put off the conciliation and proceed to, to the conference with whatever we were given on the, by that day. Um, and it did, I think, work out in our favour. Um, in terms of the policies and procedures, I think that probably fits a little bit more neatly with a systemic issue complaint, um, which is kind of what we were saying we would press on with if they didn't give us the information or if, if we weren't able to resolve it on the day. Um, and so we wanted to sort of get them to feel a bit worried that this was going to be more broad and that we were going to kind of, um, you know, poke around and want to understand a bit more about how this might affect, you know, many, many, many more consumers and customers of the bank. Um, so those are just sort of some practical tips. Um, but yeah, through the AFCA process, there isn't kind of, we don't have um, the same sorts of tools that we have in our toolkit like we do when we're litigating, unfortunately. Oh, great, thank you both um, for that. I think it's really um, it's really helpful to sort of get a bit more of that granular information about how to go about some of this uh, and, and where you can push. So thank you for that. Siobhan's got a follow-up question here, actually a separate issue, I think. Um, she said she had a client who was advised to roll their money into an SMSF. They signed a form to make this happen and a genuine SMFS was created. They transferred money to the advisor but spent the rest. While being low financial sophistication in general, they had no specific vulnerabilities. Is it worth the penalties they'd face for improper access to the self-managed super fund if they lodged a complaint against the original super fund for allowing the rollover based on a third party with a signed form? Yeah, I mean, obviously that sounds like a, a, a considerably more difficult 
matter than um, Lee Brazzers and the other scenario where they've handed over some information which has then been sort of synthesized into fraudulent forms that have been submitted. Um, here it looks as though the, the, the actual form was was submitted by, if not completed by the um, the consumer themselves. Um, I suppose that um, you, you could look at whether or not they the consumer um, completed that or, or, or acted in that manner based on misrepresentations or or um, or, or, or lies that um, that they were uh, that, that they were told um, by a scammer. Um, and therefore weren't sort of weren't sort of or even if they were acting under duress but but absent that sort of argument um, I think it's going to be going to be pretty difficult to um, to make a, a claim um, on the on the grounds that I've laid out um, in in Lee Brazzer's case for example that um, the form wasn't submitted by the member or the consent wasn't given by the member themselves um, as for the question of consequences by the uh, self by the ATO um, for pulling money out uh, of the superannuation uh, environment, um, presumably not on the basis of any statutory early release clause, um, yeah, that, that's that's a that's a problem. <laughs> um, so uh, that's I mean that's a separate issue that the ATO are really strict about that. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there would be much that can be done about that again, unless um, you, you could show that um, the transaction was done based on some sort of misconception or confusion that was caused by a third by a third party. Um, uh, I mean, we come across this sort of issue with financial advice um, from time to time, and and can, have had success. Um, seeking compensation back from financial advisors who have provided negligent personal advice to withdraw money out of the superannuation environment, and then um, the consumer's been been stung with uh, an ATO bill. So there may be some sort of arguments that can be made about that, but um, it's a it's a it's a tough case. Yeah, it does. It sounds like a really tough one. Uh, one last question uh, before we let you go comes from Jackson. Uh, when advocating for a client in the Africa space, how much strategy can be employed in reaching a settlement by utilising the embarrassment factor? That being how embarrassing will this be for the bank uh, if they lose publicly, publicly and will that motivate a successful mediation? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, and I think it, it, it part of the answer is that um, one way to sort of press their buttons is to um, is to um, highlight or, or find an argument that it, that the issue is systemic or more widespread than just relating to your particular client, um, and 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 pushing for documents and uh, and just generally making them uncomfortable about the um, the compliance of their systems. Um, so so I think I think it is it is worth. Um, exploring that in in most cases, um, the other good um, development in in recent years is that Africa does now publish the names of financial services providers in their in their determinations. They didn't used to do that, um, so now they used to de-identify them. So now um, they will be named and shamed in the determination, and it will be published. So that helps too. Yeah, I would I would add to that and just say that you know you can sort of take advantage of the conciliation process, which is quite different from say a mediation process that you have in a litigated matter where you need to keep your powder dry on certain things and you don't necessarily, you don't want your client to do any talking. Um, whereas at conciliation, you know, you first have to assess whether your client can contribute in the joint session or not. But I had the client's mother in the conciliation with me and there were certain elements, there were certain human elements that she was able to add um, which were very useful and very helpful, I felt. So I sort of played the role of the, of the, you know, the legal advocate doing all the technical points, um, but then she was able to, you know, inject that human element as well and how it affected her family and, and her son and certainly the vulnerability 
um, factor two was a big part of our, um, our case. And so that was a bit easier to inject um, in that room um, by, by highlighting how, um, you know, essentially embarrassing this was to the bank and how largely they failed our client. And certainly we suspected many other customers of the bank as well. So, you know, you can be a little bit, um, you know, I suppose, um, I wouldn't say it's cheeky, but I think you can use the conciliation process to your advantage mm. in that way, um, in a way that, you know, it's very different. We would approach it very differently if we were going into an immediation in a litigated matter. Mm. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you both so much. I think it's really um, interesting to, to dig into that and, and how you use those mechanisms that are available and and pressure them uh, where, where you possibly can. So, Thank you both so much. I think we'll leave it there given the time. Um, they were sort of the main questions that had come through, I think. So uh, just a huge thank you to you both for your time and expertise. I would have to say for myself, I found it both fascinating and um, really frustrating and terrifying all at the same time. So uh, it's been a really, really interesting session. Uh, thanks also to everyone who's joined the session today. Uh, before you go, just a reminder to complete the feedback survey that will pop up on your screen once the webinar is closed. Your feedback, your feedback does really help us to continually improve our webinar program. So that's it from us for today. Thank you so much again. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next CLCQ webinar, but it's bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>